to believe that other folks won't join in, but uh, we have a very full agenda. So I would like for us to uh, come to order and get started. Uh, the very first thing on the agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, presumably, you've all had a chance to see the minutes. Is there a motion? I move. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. There's been first and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Uh, next meeting will be March 11th. Uh, I chose to put a council update because I always am curious <clears throat> what Tonya has to say, but she's not here. So, uh, uh, but Stu is. So let's move on to the staff update. Um, very good. I think uh, the main thing I wanted to point out uh, is that Bridget and I have been working on the website. Uh, the outreach campaign will be going out uh, next month. So by the time we have our next meeting, I think things will be underway to a degree. Um, to the extent that you folks uh, would like to help promote that and share it around with your networks, that would be wonderful. Um, Bridget, do you have anything you want to say about the campaign or the website or it's up to you. Yeah, um, thank you all for people who have sent me feedback so far. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about um, real quick, I don't know if I mentioned in meetings before, is that we have a Facebook page for Ashland Climate and Energy now. Um, so if you are a Facebook user, um, <laughs> please uh, feel free to like the page or share it. Um, and also, um, from the, if the commission would like to share anything to that page. Um, we're thinking like an article, uh, maybe once or twice a month. We're definitely open to that and you can send that our way and we'll... Um... All right, thanks. Um, I think I'm just gonna leave it at that for now, unless anyone has a specific question they want me to touch in on. And I see that Tanya is also here now. So maybe we can go back a step, Rick, if you want. Yeah. Uh, Tanya, without specifically informing you, I stuck a item for a council update on there because uh, I'm sure we're all uh, intensely curious uh, how things are going with the new council and all. Yeah, so um, it's a it's a very busy time for council because of the upcoming budget process, and we're um, we're needing to move through a number of things that we will not have time for in that March April time space. So we've had pretty packed agendas. Um, one thing I, that is particularly relevant, I think, to this commission is that we are going to have a work plan session with the council where we look at what staff has on their plate that we need to move through over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. And then we see what kind of capacity exists. And then we work together to decide what are the most important things that the council itself wants to move through in addition to the things that we're mandated to do. And so part of what I need to be working on now is, is what are those asks as they relate to climate. So that's a big part of what I'm looking at this commission and the work of the commission to figure out what is it that, that we want to ask for um, and, get, and get onto the, the calendar with. Um, one other good bit of news is that um, staff, the, the public works uh, department came back in front of staff or in front of the council because they needed kind of a policy decision about the UV um, system at the wastewater treatment facility. And um, essentially one type of system is cheaper, but it took three times the energy to run it. <laughs> so they, in, in order to avoid getting in a place where they were trapped um, taking the, um, the cheapest bid, essentially, they wanted to know which of these two things was more important to us. Um, that we were, got the absolute cheapest option or that we um, uh, or the energy use. And the council pretty much unanimously said, go with the type of system that gives us the better energy use. And so um, that was, and it went through pretty quickly. I think there's, there's good commitment on the, on the part of the larger council for, for climate work. So just wanted to give a little, little update on that. 
So just as an example, the uh, energy utility strategic plan would be one of the types of things you're looking for. Yeah, what, and, and we want to, you know, that the energy, that utility strategic plan might already be on that list that's coming from staff, I don't know. But if it's not, then yeah, that, that's what I would want to know is sort of what's my top, what are my top five things that we're trying to get done on climate this year in priority order, <laughs> right? And then, and then we, we, um, we integrate those because the, each counselor is going to have their short list as well of the things that they think are really important for us to deal with outside of those mandated elements. So. When do you need our short list by? Pardon me? When do you need our short list by? Um, well, it's, uh, we are, we haven't set the date for that. It'll probably be in the next three weeks to a month that we have that session. And so, um, yeah, and, and, and sure. these, the, these priorities will, will be put on my list along with some others from, from other commissions that I'm working with, so. Okay, thank you, Tanya. Mm -hmm. I, I assume we're ready, oh no, uh, Ray? Yeah, Tanya, so this short list, is that just things we need council ask for or just you wanna show um, what we're working on? No, it's, it's things that, what are the things that we're trying to do that are going to take um, staff and council time? Okay. over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. And so, um, and, and some of those, you know, if it's something relatively small, we don't necessarily want to spend this space on it. But if we have, you know, what are the major things that we would really like to see happen by the end of this year um, or the end of 18 months um, that, that need council involvement and staff involvement, um, you know, at, outside of Stu. So like, for instance, if we were doing an ordinance or, or some sort of planning, um, planning uh, ordinances, that sort of thing. It takes, it takes um, folks in the planning department, it takes administrative staff, it takes the legal staff. Um, those kinds, things that rise to that level are the things that we're going to want to um, uh, know which, which ones are most important. Okay, thanks. Uh, Gary? One. So is this for the budget year or just for next fiscal year? Um, we, uh, we have, have, we haven't really decided. We're, we've been looking at sort of that 12 to 18 months, could be 24 months, but I think that as fast as things are shifting right now, it probably will need to be revisited anyway at the end of 12 months, so. Okay, uh, are there other announcements from uh, the commissioners? Not seeing any, and I believe there's no other commissioner representative, commission representatives. Uh, so I think we're ready to uh, move on to public forum. Uh, presumably you have all seen the contact form that was uh, sent in. Uh, I, there was a request uh, for uh, oral uh, public forum as well. So uh, are we ready to go with that? Do you want me to just jump in? Yes, please, Laura. Okay, thank you, Chairman Barth, and hello, commissioners, everyone, staff. Um, thank you for giving me just a couple minutes here. I know you have a very busy agenda, so I put on my stopwatch here. Um, so I did want to bring your attention to the memo that I know was in your packet, um, but has timelines associated with it. Um, I wanted to say, though, first, that everything that I'm talking about is about cross-cutting strategy CC1, educate and empower the public. And that's what we choose to do uh, at the Ashland Climate Action Project of SOCAN. Um, so we are doing this survey this year uh, in partnership with uh, SOU Office of Sustainability. And we want that to be a really robust uh, process with community engagement and have the results be uh, as valid as possible and meaningful as possible to support the work of the city and this commission um, to achieve our climate goals. So please notice on that memo that's in your packet that we are forming an advisory panel. Um, and so we'll be reaching out to not just this commission but also uh, throughout the community, faith-based community schools, everything to try to get uh, a few really good folks on that advisory panel to help shape that survey. 
Um, and then we are also just accepting topics from the general public uh, by March 15th. So there's links in that memo for you to click on um, and engage with us as individuals and however you want. And please help us spread the word because our goal is um, you know, to support the achievement of the goals of the SEEP. This is a process that's gonna run all year. We're doing it uh, very professionally with SOU statistical support and Qualtrics survey platform. Um, so it's gonna go all year, be done by November 15th. So uh, you'll be hearing more about that, but thank you for your support on that. Um, I also want to let you know, uh, March 11th, we're doing an educational program on natural gas. What's wrong with it? Um, and we plan to do several on renewable energy this year, again, in trying to align with the commission's goal of electrification of Ashland. Last thing, uh, in our last, uh, in your January uh, meeting, we did re request that you support our um, recommendation that knowledge of climate uh, plan impl implementation be included among the qualifications. I know that the conservation and Climate Outreach Commission is writing a memo uh, to that effect. Um, not exactly the wording we suggested, but um, that's a time, time sensitive process, as you know. Um, and I think that would be very powerful for this commission um, to support that recommendation that the next 10 years is gonna be very important for uh, climate leadership in this community and the city manager should be in a lead role on that. Thank you, Chairman Barth. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, uh, let's see, where am I here? Oh, uh, so on the, on the old business, uh, I think Jeff volunteered to take the action items for this month. Um, do we have a volunteer for next month? Chris, thank you. <clears throat> um, commissioner for recruitment, uh, I think Tonya or Stu, you had uh, somebody uh, potentially that you mentioned at the last meeting. Uh, is there anything about that? I have heard nothing about that. <clears throat> I checked in with Melissa and they have, we haven't received um, that application yet. I did though receive, um, I, uh, someone reached out to me who is now going to be working with Native American students in the high schools. Um, I think at least in, in Ashland and maybe, maybe Talent Phoenix, I'm not sure how far she, she goes, but she was looking for ways for her students to um, to in, you know to be involved locally with local government, and so I sent our information over, and she's going to share it with them when she gets them up and running. So um, hopefully, we'll at least have a high school student coming pretty soon. But uh, the efforts at SOU haven't gone anywhere, and other efforts at the high school haven't haven't gotten much of a response from. Great. And I want to remind anybody that's listening uh, that there is a full regular voting member position that's still open and uh, we would love to have more help. Okay, the next thing is the memo uh, that I sent out. Uh, I want to just briefly touch on a few things. Uh, and, and invite response. Uh, so I, I made some statements and I uh, would like to know whether there's consensus in the commission um, for those uh, statements. Um, there's a section that uh, talks about uh, binning the various agenda items into my expectations for how we're gonna deal with them at this meeting. Uh, there's also a section that restates the uh, priorities uh, from last August in priority or, order. And uh, I'd like to hear whether that uh, is still the consensus of the commission. Uh, and then there is a proposal for how we will spend our limited time for the SEEP update. Uh, so does any, do any of the commissioners have uh, a comment about any of those topics? Bob. Um, Rick, I don't, are you intending, to, I see you've only allocated six minutes for this. Uh, are you intending to have a conversation about the SEEP update here or in the SEEP update section, which is a 20 minute section where you talk in you know, much greater length, but you've got some questions here in your memo that I don't know, I don't know where you're wanting to talk about that. Uh, well, right now, the only thing I would want to talk about is whether that sequence of three steps uh, is the appropriate sequence for this meeting. 
uh, the actual resolution of anything within that, uh, I want to defer until the CEEP update section. That's great. That's terrific. Okay. And then my only other uh, comment is I was influenced by the SOCAN Ashland Climate Action Pl Project's uh, present session last week, or I think it was last week, on transit equity. And I, it seems to me that the number three transportation emissions reduction, including through electrification, of course, it also should include biking, walking, and public transport. Um, there are, there are, we learned that road, um, road Valley Transportation RT, RVTD is actually doing a fair bit, um, more than we expected um, in terms of reducing their emissions. Uh, were leaders in some sense and then felt like they got a little bit uh, uh, snake bit, but are, are definitely have their focus on on what they can do in the future. So I think some public transport um, solutions, uh, transport equity uh, are, should also be at least on our, on our radar screen. Yes, and including was <clears throat> meant to be without limitation. I know, I know that's true, but I just wanted to, thought I'd take the opportunity to make the, make the plug. Because we mostly yeah, talked about- I'm mostly uh, assuming that, that Gary is already going for, for that. And I believe he signed up to uh, address that section of the CEEP update. Uh, so right. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up, uh, but I, I think we're moving in that direction. Uh, Ray? I think I like the idea of us um, trying to spend the bulk of our time on implementation, things that we're trying to get done relative to the SEEP, um, rather than always trying to be working on the SEEP. I mean, I think a lot of people feel we want to get things done. And so I like that. Um, with respect to your three numbers on the SEEP, I would say uh, continue 2.2, uh, .2, uh, multiple author writing process, and then three, as time allows, review the document management. So I know we'll get more into timelines and how much time we should spend and when it should be done. But I, I would think we'd want to, in parallel, in the background, keep working on uh, on an update. Okay, uh, I was proposing that we get into the level of detail you're going into during the SEEP update section, uh, rather than trying to do that right now. Okay, anything else? Uh, Stu? Uh, I would just like to say thank you very much for laying the groundwork so well of which items we expect to talk about. I think that's very helpful. Well, thank you. <laughs> it is a fair amount of work. Uh, with that, I think we're ready to move on to 5.4. Um, Ray? Okay. Um, based on discussion from last week, we added the economic development strategy to the tracking list. And there was some discussion with Adam of when that's going to happen. I put, he didn't know if it was this year or next year, and also some coordination with One Rogue Valley Plan and uh, SOR EDI. So um, we'll see where that goes. Um, I think they're pretty well tied up with some of the grant process right now relative to development. But we'll have that on there for future tracking. And then uh, before our next meeting, we do have uh, an adoption for the capital improvement program. And I provided Scott a couple of feedbacks and he said he was gonna put that in. I haven't seen that yet, but uh, he said it shouldn't be a problem. Um, Gary, uh, there you had a question on the comp plan. I did send you a note on that. So give me some feedback offline about that. Gary was wondering if uh, where to put uh, natural disasters, if we should uh, include part of that. And uh, I think what I saw that there is an environmental uh, part of the comp plan, which deals with wildfire. So any other questions on this plan? That's, that, that's the main updates. Oh, uh, Stu, I still haven't heard about, are we gonna to get together on the Daniel Pool renovation? Have you heard anything back from Mr. Black? Uh, I have not heard directly from them. I heard uh, 
few weeks back, I suppose, that the consultants are going to be presenting some of the alternatives. Um, that was the last I heard. I can give you a, a very quick update on that if you're interested. Okay, thanks, Julian. Well, so there's four alternatives in grades of how much natural gas they're gonna use. One of them is the old natural gas. And then there's two that are sort of part natural gas, part electric. And then there's one that's all electric, which is the most expensive. And the difference, if I remember correctly, is around about $400,000 between the least and the most. And the total bill for the most expensive all renewable uh, version would be, I believe, 4.9 million. Um, so yeah, well, we, we saw the original plan presentation and what we wanted was a discussion with the commission on the oh, options. Well, so the on last uh, Wednesday of last week, there was a public meeting which reviewed the Daniel Meyer pool um, plan with the different um, heating options included in that review. And the meeting is still, I mean, like it's public, you know, it's a, was recorded. So it's there for anybody to look at if they're interested. Um, but to sort of summarize the plan, the, the architectural plan of the pool is basically more or less, uh, you know, not, not gonna change particularly. The only thing that was different was the different heating uh, system proposals. And like I say, the one that's, you know, the one that I think I would, the one that I would support, the one that I think the commission will probably support is the one that's the all renewable um, based heating system. Okay. Yeah, we were hoping to have a meeting with the commission so we could discuss this and see which one we would support, which, you know, you've already given us the options there. But to well, have more detail with the whole commission, it seems like you might be uh, better served by meeting with two or three different members of the commission. Well, my, my understanding is that. Uh, the director was going to meet with CPC at some time. Right. And uh, given the meeting you just described, it seems like the time is quite ripe and that we should not delay any further. Uh, so uh, Stu, I think you had the action to follow up on that. Uh, could you- Yeah, I, uh, and I did contact them a few times when I did, uh, I think Michael Black was out of town and I had not heard back from them. So I will reach out again. Great, thank you. That so meeting. Julian, a quick question. Did they factor in lifetime costs of energy or uh, social cost of carbon or anything like that? Or was it just straight up front capital costs? Straight up front capital costs. They also didn't include, um, and I still don't know how long it would take or how what the lifespan of the heating uh, systems are. Like does a natural gas boiler last for 10 years and the HVAC systems, or I should say the heat pump system last for five years? Uh, that I don't know either. Julian, I have a question as well. Um, if you see as a member of the Parks and Recreation Commission an opportunity for us to engage with the commission that comes up sooner rather than later, would you please let us know so that we don't miss an opportunity to engage with the commission? Certainly. Good. Yeah, yeah, I find, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, Bob, and then uh, Tanya. Yeah, um, I mean, I was at the public meeting, uh, I was zoomed into the public meeting uh, a month ago, over a month ago in December, and Michael Black said, he was going to come, he was going to make a presentation to the CPC. And I think I took him at his word and I think the public took him at his word. So I, I'm a little frustrated that we that he's difficult to pin down to actually come and make a presentation to the CPC. This is great to have Julian, you know, report to us kind of the outlines, but we, we've heard those things before. And I think we have very strong concerns about the way that this could actually be designed. These alternatives, you know, have massively different climate implications. And to actually risk uh, a, a less than a, a you know a full airing of the of the of the options, where we could be embedding natural gas or you know carbon uh, uh, for decades, it, you know is is uh, is um, is distressing. So I um, 
we don't know what we can do uh, to make Mr. Black to uh, do what he said he was going to do, which he said he was going to do it in January, I believe. We could go get the tape, but um, I would like to register my my frustration that it's taken so long for this to happen. Well, just and not to prolong this topic particularly, but I think Director Blank Black is mostly acting in good faith. I mean, I think he's entirely acting in good faith. I do know that he has a lot of demands on his time, but just for the sake of being able to see, yeah, you know, and so do all of the rest of us too. But just for the sake of um, being able to actually get the information, this last meeting from last Wednesday gives you a lot of very detailed information about the options. And as far as um, being a part of the process of making the decision, uh, if anybody's interested, they can certainly talk directly with Commissioner uh, Gardner, who would be, um, you, know, you know, who could maybe speak to the general feelings about the different options of the commissioners. Okay, so uh, I share the frustration. Uh, I, I don't want to belabor this, uh, but Tanya, I think you had your hand up before I was trying to move on. So go ahead. Seems that the the most straightforward um, next step is to ask him to come to us in March, assuming that that's not too late for the the commission's decision. Um, is that uh, Julian? How is that with the timing of what the Parks Commission is is looking to do? Uh, that seems like it would fit fairly well. We haven't committed to one plan or another, and I and yeah, that seems like it, the um, timing would be reasonably good. I would okay. be happy to um, to put that request in, um, or Stu, or I could, you know, um, however we want to do that is fine with me. Uh, I, I'd be happy for uh, somebody with the dual role that you have, Tanya, uh, to uh, make that request along with Stu. Okay, uh, I have already emailed him, so feel free to follow up, Tanya. Um, so just to check my understanding, uh, last I heard, the money was not available to actually build this thing yet. Is that still true? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> it doesn't relieve my frustration with what's going on, but that makes me a little more relaxed about it. Okay, I captured that as an action item for Tonya to invite Michael Black to the March 11th meeting. Along with Stu's contact, yes. And, and so I guess, Julian, then uh, we could look again at this second public meeting uh, that was recorded or something. That's on the city website? Yeah, I believe so. The, I mean, I haven't okay. tried to track it down, but yes, I think you can get to it on the city website. APR right. Ashland Parks meeting last Wednesday. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, also don't want to prolong the discussion. Um, but my understanding from that meeting was it was not going to just be Michael Black, but it was going to be the specialist consultants who actually have all of the detailed technical knowledge. Uh, and he particularly in that in that meeting mentioned the CPC. Um, so. Okay. I, I think we uh, come up with a plan for how we're going to move forward on that one. Um, Let's see. So, uh, Ray, are, are, you, are you done with your section? Yes, I am done. I took more than my time. Uh, but that's fine. We, uh, we had some slack, so we're, we're still on track here. Uh, the next agenda item is 5.5, clean fuels. Uh, uh, Tanya has her. Oops. <laughs> Tanya? <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I just want everyone to know that um, in a uh, declared emergency, the Parks Department are, is the, they're the folks who are overseeing all of our health and human service um, requirements for the emergency. And those have been skyrocketing with COVID over the last several weeks. So I, I think we can expect um, good faith responses, but we should just really be mindful of what they're dealing with over at Parks. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, Stu, uh, clean fuels. Uh, very good. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, hopefully, everybody got a chance to read through this. I think uh, I had promised at some point to bring forward our thoughts on the allocation of the first round of clean fuels revenue, which, because we've never received it before, has to be brought in uh, through a budget amendment. Um, so I've laid out here, uh, I, I know it, for folks who've read this, I don't know that I have much more to add, except maybe to hear your questions, but I've made an effort to uh, put some context around the program, uh, how we began participating in it a few years back, 
Um, also, a, a quick synopsis of what I consider to be the highest uses of these funds. Um, and then also a, a general overview of where we're thinking this is going to go. Um, you know, I think one of the things about this, it's a new revenue stream. I'm very much hoping that this will drive climate programming uh, because uh, to be completely honest, there's not much else. And I think it's really important to maximize the, the uses of this fund and make sure that it's working towards our goals. And I see that we do have a lot of different goals. And right now this funding is not restricted for any particular use. I think that that could very much happen in the future. Uh, this is all derived from transportation uh, projects for the most part, fuels projects. And so uh, there's a desire by the state that it sort of stay close to home and continue that good work. Uh, but that said, we have some opportunities here in Ashland, especially around our built environment, um, you know, improving our building stock and so on. Uh, those are huge opportunities that are currently unfunded. Um, I think we could very well be putting some of the clean fuels funds toward our housing stock and trying to make things better in that regard. Um, the last thing I'll say before I take questions, I guess, is uh, the receipt of these funds is a little bit delayed because uh, we've never done this before uh, as a city. And surprisingly, uh, you know, most of the folks who participate in the clean fuels program are for-profit corporations or um, you know, businesses of some sort. And so they have a little bit easier time transacting the credits. Uh, for us, we had to put a new process in place and sort of get some guidelines on uh, what's fair to our rate payers. Uh, are we gonna take the bottom price or the top price hold out? Um, so it just took a long time to get that uh, running. Uh, so some of the things that are in this draft allocation are things that the city of Ashland has already committed to. Um, and I was sort of banking on this money uh, to make those programs happen in the first place. And now that the funds have finally arrived, they're more or less earmarked for those uses. Um, not 100%, but I just wanted to sort of build some context around why did I pick this stuff? Uh, and it's all because it's what I consider to be pretty high impact uh, or otherwise unfunded uh, and uh, also, some of this has been committed to already. So um, with that, I see Julian was very quick with the raise of the hand. What's your question, Julian? How many other cities around Oregon are doing this? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it's a, this is a utility program. It's not a city program. Uh, so there are a couple of other municipal utilities. I think only one or two other ones. Uh, there's a variety of consumer-owned utilities, um, co-ops and such, that also participate. But uh, those are not cities. So. Um, there's only a couple cities. Uh, I don't know what the current number is, but it's just a handful. Uh, Ray? Yeah, Stu, you mentioned uh, some of the money might go to housing. Were you, did you mean as far as energy retrofit or some other form? Yeah, and it, that's, the, that's the sort of earmark that we're looking at okay. right now is uh, basically, you know, I would like all the clean fuels money to either reduce the amount of carbon that's going up in the air inside our city limits, preferably, uh, and also take care of any urgent needs that otherwise we can't take care of. Um, so, yeah. And when I say housing, I, I'm, I think that there's, like I said, an opportunity down the road or a possibility down the road that this funding might be restricted to transportation uses. But right now, because it's not, I think another noble use is to electrify our building stock which is another form of clean fuels. It's just not uh, the specific design of this program to help the built environment. And I think you were looking for the, uh, the electric utility to own these funds for disbursement, I think. They, yeah, it is yeah. electric revenue. Stu, I've just noticed it says 1921. Is, is that right? Or is oh, it I'm sorry, that's, that's my fault. That should say 2123. Oh. Well, no, actually, that's a good question, because I think that this is going to be amended into the current budget, but some of the expenditures here are going to be planned for the future. So I don't know the answer to that question. Um, sorry. I have a good question for you, Stu. Um, if you think it's likely that the money is going to be allocated to transportation issues in the future, is there mm -hmm. any way that the prioritization of the current funds could be more focused on energy retrofit for homes? Um, currently, we can spend it as we like. Um, 
you know, it is electric revenue, so it should stay close to that tree uh, if possible. But the way we have it laid out here, it's pretty much doing that. So, uh, you know, we could prioritize certain uses of it. I know that the Transportation Commission has already expressed an opinion that we should spend this money on things that create more clean fuel credits, which is a common use. Um, say, for example, EV incentives. Uh, the more people drive EVs, the more uh, future clean fuel credits we'll get. Um, but I don't think that that's the only use of these. It's just, um, it's perhaps the smartest financial investment if we're looking at money as the bottom line. But if we're looking at carbon, um, there are many other opportunities out there. Stu, uh, can you yeah, yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the uh, manpower or the FTE and what those people would be doing and how that dovetails into all of these other programs? Yeah, so uh, when I arrived, there was really no dedicated funding for climate. Um, part of my initial mission was to try to find funding sources for myself so that I wouldn't get cut out or that the position wouldn't get cut out. Uh, so currently, my position is funded out of the electric fund, um, and we're proposing for this allocation that part of that go to offset me or part of me. Uh, and then the rare position uh, was sort of always predicated on the idea of getting clean fuels credits uh, and using those to pay for the rare. Um, you know, if the, we do that in future clean fuel cycles, I think is up for debate. Um, but we're kind of at the point where we can't add any uh, sort of extra staffing with the existing budget. So we have to use some sort of new revenue to do that. Does that answer your question? I think the staffing piece is up for, uh, you know, conversation at some point. Um, but this initial round, this is sort of where we had thought it would go. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, the, so the D Oregon DEQ was fairly close, I think, to uh, wanting to restrict this revenue to clean fuels projects, but as a sort of um, consolation uh, to not doing that, we, we have the flexibility still to spend it how we please, uh, but we're required to provide pretty detailed reporting to the state about how it's being used. Um, and I think over time, there will be an expectation that only a fraction go to administrative support but we're still learning about how all the different parties are spending this revenue. And we've never spent it yet uh, directly. So uh, this will be a little bit of a learning for us too. Gary? So Stu, is this an annual allocation, you think roughly $300,000 per year or is this quarterly? What's the time frame? This is uh, our annual from our 2019 credits. Um, I can't speak to what it's going to do in the future because it's a dynamic market and we just don't, I, it would be disingenuous of me to say that it's going to be the same. Uh, we simply don't know. Uh, I think there's an expectation that it will continue and they're trying to build stability into the program. Um, but there, well, there's a couple of different factors at play. One is how does the program fare overall at the state level? Uh, this program currently is approved through 2035, so it's a pretty long-term program. I think we can expect to see some amount of revenue coming in uh, annually. They may change that to semi-annually, but currently we get a, basically once a year, we get a big shot of, in, of uh, clean fuel credits. Um, the other thing is that next year, uh, they may uh, claw back some of our credits because of an accounting error that was not our fault. Um, from the previous year. So I don't know what the extent of that will be yet. Um, that's something I need to find out fairly soon. So are you looking for any more uh, feedback? Not, not tonight, um, <clears throat> on the partition for the funds? Um, I would like to hear your input. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, we don't have all of this money lined up yet. This is sort of my, uh, communication about what we're hoping to do with it. Um, so if there's any uh, serious disagreement or feedback you'd like to give, I would really like to know that. It could be offline, it doesn't have to be this moment. Um, but also if there's a recognition that actually these do seem like uh, good uses of the fund, I would appreciate the you know, confidence of the commission. Uh, that will be helpful. And I think once the budget amendment goes uh, in front of council, of course, you know, people may want to pick it apart, but I'm hoping that that won't happen. Bob? 
I think Tanya's been at wanting to talk for some time. I saw her hand up before, but I, I'm happy to, for you to go first, Tanya, and or I'll. Okay. So I, I I like your what you're proposing, Stu. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think some of the the, the justification that you provided makes a makes a lot of sense. Um, mindful that this goes before the council as a budget amendment with a, with other budget amendments. I, I assume it'll be packaged with a kind of an omnibus. That's the wrong term, but a bunch of other things that are going to have to be done in the in the budget. I'm wondering if this level of detail is the appropriate level of detail. This is this doesn't seem to me, or or I guess it's a question: are, Is this the budget line detail that is required? Or are these uh, some of these things parts of other programs that would would provide um, sufficient um, you know sufficient uh, detail and support for uh, for a council decision? That's just mindful of how to how to frame it in a way that's going to be most helpful for council taking taking a decision on these things. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tanya. Did you have a question? Yeah, I guess the, my my question is just. Is there something that this commission can do to be supportive of this um, process moving forward? Um, you know, it's, I think there's generally support on the council for letting clean energy credits go back into investments in clean energy. Um, but there, you know, we have some new counselors on and I don't know if there's a, a conversation that should be had with some folks or, or what, but I'm happy to be involved with that and, um, and help make sure people understand this program and 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 how it um, brings more money to us in the future if we keep reinvesting. Yeah, thanks. Would um, would anything from the council, this commission, be helpful, or do you think not? You know, I don't know that it's necessary. Um, I, on the one hand, would invite a communication of support. On the other hand, I don't want to like do a lot of hand waving around it and make it be a big deal because I think that this is pretty well rationalized as far as how we're going to spend it. Uh, and I'd be happy to, you know, take the criticism from council and, you know, defend why we're choosing to do this. Um, so I don't know that we need that, but if I can see today that, you know, I don't know that we need to write a letter or a memo or anything, but if I can verbally say with confidence that this group supports the decision making, I'd be happy to communicate that, you know, if and when I get on the hot seat, so. Well, maybe we just uh, do a, a thumbs thing. I, I I support what you're doing here. Thank you. And it appears that you have the support of the commission. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Oh, Ray. Just one last question maybe for Tanya. Do, do we think there's some risk since it isn't specifically allocated that some counselors might wanna take this money for some other budget shortfalls? Or does there seem to be support think, to keep it <laughs> to keep it where it is in in the uh, you know renewable uh, can, energy side of things? Tanya, you can speak to that if you want, but I have something to say too. Oh, go ahead, Stu. I'll come in behind you. You know, my understanding is that this is electric revenue, and it's not going to disappear into the general fund. Um, you know, how it gets spent at the end of the day could be up for debate, but um, I think that this is going to be pretty well within the electric revenue fund. Okay. No, we're, that we're was what I was going to add. Here. Okay. okay. I'm done no, with my piece. Thank good. you all very much. I, I think we've kind of got the sense of the commission and I'd like to move on. Uh, the, the next topic is the energy utility plan. Uh, Jeff? Okay, uh, so we've been working on scoping or putting, putting together an outline uh, for a master plan for Ashland's electric utility. And we've identified the major components of the master plan. And, and I'm gonna tick through a few of those. Uh, infrastructure plan, power purchase plan, rate design, risk assessment, hazard mitigation, local generation and storage and community electrification. So you can see that there's a lot of different uh, discrete elements that would go into this uh, master plan. It's also got to con consider each one of these elements has to consider uh, things like equity impacts on low income consumers, uh, incentives and disincentives to electrification, uh, changes in power supply and distribution structure and pricing, 
uh, for example, in the Columbia River Gorge, there's an awful lot of wind energy being generated and some, some very large projects up there. And it's not really clear to us at this point or, or the utility where that energy is going and what the opportunities are there versus BPA's hydropower. Um, uh, another consideration are the, the technical trends and the regulatory trends that cover things like solar power, electric vehicles and uh, microgrids. So our proposal is that the master planning process kicks off by updating this uh, seven-year-old electric planning study. So this is typically done on, on a 10-year cycle, but this, uh, this analysis and forecast in this electric systems planning study, it's really the foundation for master plan. Uh, the current study is uh, already rather badly outdated, but it does a good job of uh, the basics of load forecasting, power distribution, system reliability, but there's some real key issues that it doesn't uh, address in, uh, in today's world. And that includes things like integration of local solar power generation, uh, cyber security, uh, potential for microgrids and uh, the changes that I mentioned in regional uh, power supply and distribution. So that's our proposal is that, that we kick off this effort with updating this uh, seven-year-old electric system planning study and then that rolls into these other major components as we move through the next year. Um, and so our plan uh, with uh, Stu's help is that in the near future, we'll, we'll engage Tom McBartlett, the director of the electric utility on the path forward and try to get alignment with, uh, with city staff in the electric utility. I can add a little brief follow on to that, which is I had a short meeting with Tom and Adam to just talk about this concept uh, all at once. Uh, they're generally uh, in agreement that this would be a good way to go. And I think it'll make a nice backbone for any future planning uh, and you know, building on something that we already have specifically something that would be up for refreshing pretty soon anyway, uh, seemed like a good way to go because we have a you know, precedent for it. Um, and Tom tells me that basically everything that was in the previous plan, uh, the tenure plan that they had hoped to do, uh, that they had actually done, except for, I think, the substation purchase, which we haven't completed yet. Um, so that's good. And the, our action item from that meeting is that uh, Tom and Adam and I are going to spend a little time with the documents and regroup to uh, have a better sense of what we're going to ask the engineers to do and we'll also circle back with Jeff and Ray and whomever else uh, we would need to talk to about that. Uh, Tanya? Yeah, in this planning process, is this a good place for us to be talking about um, resilience with our utility systems? So with wastewater, water, um, microgrids around those types of elements. I know we have some restrictions with Bonneville, but it seems like this is a good place to bring that in for the technical consultation um, piece is to ask them that question as well. Yes, um, definitely. The, uh, you know, one of the concepts that, that we've kicked around is forming a microgrid that includes uh, basic city services like fire, police, and hospitals is, is kind of a, a pilot, if you will. Some, some of these facilities already have backup power generators and so on. But yeah, that's, Rick is kind of a mastermind in that area. Rick, you wanna comment on microgrids in general? Well, right, the concept is to have three different uh, scenarios. Uh, one is basically the business as usual with BPA. One is the spine that Jeff was re just referring to uh, that tries to keep a minimum level of functionality uh, when you have something that knocks out the grid like an earthquake. Uh, and then the most extensive uh, scenario is to move the generation to the grid edge. So that we're looking at uh, primarily solar power and behind the meter batteries and that sort of thing and the ability to completely disconnect from the grid and remain operational. Uh, so that is roughly uh, 
the spread of scenarios that we've been talking about. Um, and <clears throat> I wanna add on to that, uh, that my biggest concern is that this is a relatively huge project that's gonna demand uh, massive staff time and consulting time uh, to get this done in time for it to uh, influence our choice when the BPA uh, contract renewal comes around. So I think it's important uh, to recognize that this is a huge impact on staff, but it is also incredibly important to uh, CPC goals. Uh, Bob? Yeah, thank, thanks, Rick. That's a really great uh, lead in. It strikes me that, I mean, this, I think you said it earlier, this is one of the, Tanya's, this should, this should go into Tanya's list uh, for focus for this next thing, how strategic it is. Um, I, I recall the conversation with Tom McBartlett when he came to us, I think it was in September, maybe, maybe October. Um, and he was very uh, forward leaning in doing all of this. And I appreciate all the work that, you know, members of this commission have, have done with him to set this up. Uh, my recollection at that time was it was gonna be a much, a, a, a relatively rapid or more rapid than what I'm hearing now, or, well, you haven't actually talked about time frame, but it's, but from what you just said, Rick, as well, it's striking me that this is gonna take a, you know, a, a quite extended period of time. Tom had said at that time that he has the budget already for the consultants. And my recollection is we were talking about, you know, completion in 2021. Um, it's, what is your sense of, of time frame on this? Has, this? has the scope expanded? So that's why it's uh, 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 um, maybe going to take longer than that? Or can you help enlighten us on this? Who, who are you directing the question to? Well, the team. The team. I know that uh, well, you know, all three of you, I think, are, are working on this pretty Jeff, I guess, presented, so, but, but I think it's any, I'll, anyway. I'll uh, pass the torch to Ray. He's got his hand up. Okay. Well, just to comment, Bob, I'm kind of in a different place. Originally, we were going to do a master plan, and I see uh, that was a lot of work and a lot of uh, unknowns, and I think uh, updating the rate study was biting off a smaller piece um, to limit the scope but still include the items that we think need to be in a more modern electric uh, distribution and generation uh, city uh, facility. So on one hand, I'm thinking, okay, we can do this, but we still have our master plan at some point, or maybe we'll never get one and we'll just have an updated rate study. I don't know where we'll go, but at least we're, it, it's an agreed upon plan limiting the amount of staff time we have available to work on it to get some updates and have people looking at these things that we want, like microgrids and, and generation and resiliency. So, so, so you, yeah, Bob. So th thanks, thanks, Ray. Um, you're, and you're talking about this as an energy utility plan. Uh, previously, I think we were referring to it as electric. Um, uh, master plan or electric utility plan, and I'm not sure of all the nomenclature. But it strikes me that you know we're looking for the nexus for a real strategic look at you know electrification versus other you know other, other fuels. So I'm I'm wanting this to be that you know that vehicle for that strategic discussion that that council is going to end up having, and we all want to have some some input into. Um, is this it, or am I kind of off base on this? I, I think you're exactly right. This is the nexus for transportation, electrification, and uh, fuel switching. Uh, you know, how do, how do we uh, stop investing in natural gas and start electrification? And, and that depends on having uh, a plan at the electrical utility and uh, the resiliency and the capacity to supply market rate or better uh, electricity to meet those needs. Right, but Bob, I, I think you're suggesting that you're not quite seeing the rate of progress that you might've hoped for and, and uh, the electric uh, utility strategic plan does not include everything that you're talking about in the energy uh, plan. And I, I agree with all of that. Uh, and so this group needs to move forward with the bandwidth that's available. Uh, Gary? I guess I am kind of echoing Bob's sentiment in a sense that 
if we are trying to figure out how to move forward with transportation electrification, building electrification, and generally updating the built environment to reflect the new knowns that we now have before us, that the way we're going to influence the built environment and our future built environment is through amendments to the um, comprehensive plan that give us the leverage and the capacity to actually regulate land use. And so that piece to me is must be integral to what we do in terms of the electrical utility plan. We've got to be able to spin this off into that bigger, more important in some ways, uh, spectrum of our community's development. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, I, don't, I don't know that there's anything more uh, productive that we can do tonight. Uh, I, I think that this commission has a consensus that we need to be uh, moving forward with, on this uh, at a more rapid pace. Uh, we have uh, the working group has not yet identified how that can happen. And so we will continue to pursue it. And uh, given that we're falling behind on the agenda, uh, and this was just an informational thing, we're not looking for the commission to decide anything. I'd like to move on to the next agenda item. Uh, so the next thing is uh, lightweight vehicles reducing maximum speed, uh, Gary. So between last meeting and this one, um, the legislation that we had anticipated would be introduced, this legislative session was actually introduced. I'm simply asking the commission to endorse the city's um, recommendation in essence to the Southern Oregon legislative delegation that in fact they support this bill. Um, it seems pretty straightforward to me. Um, it doesn't have a direct relationship to the CPC, although it does relate to that general um, package of benefits that we reviewed last month. So if you would make a motion and we'll vote on it, unless there's questions. Any questions? I can make a motion. I mean, I can read the motion. I move that the CPC recommend to the city council that they request that the Southern Oregon legislative delegation support the passage of HB 3055. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, so I assume that you're done, Gary? Yes, that's it. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank you <laughs> for making it short. Uh, we're uh, actually a little bit ahead of time now. Uh, next thing is the energy retrofit loan program. Bob? Hey, uh, thanks, thanks, Rick. Um, this, so last, last, uh, set, last time, last, uh, last month, uh, we presented just a, an outline of where we were in, intending. We, you, you, you'll recall that we um, are building on the existing program of the city's existing home energy retrofit loan program. It's a zero interest loan program. We came to you with a, a few changes to a few minor modifications. We listened to your to your questions and your and your suggestions, and then we went back um, to flesh out the uh, the particulars with the background and 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 all of that. Um, the documents in your packet, I, for, I didn't think to put a, a, a motion, a draft motion. I guess maybe somebody could, uh, could do that if, uh, if, if that comes to, if you decide that, that's, uh, that it's ready for that. Um, I want to thank, uh, obviously, Stu and, and Bridget and Tanya for, for all of the, the work on this. This is really a good team effort and um, um, ready to, we, we hope we can answer any of your questions. Um, Bob, I have a question. Um, looking at the funding for this, it looks like 
it would be self-sustaining after a number of years, how many years, or would you plan on just kind of continuing to grow the program over time? Um, well, um, I, I can take a crack at that. I, it's, I think it's, it would be self-sustaining at a very low level, but my ambition for this is that it would be ramped up. And in fact, I think it needs to be uh, substantially larger. We're starting relatively small. Uh, it's larger than the current zero interest loan program. It is more focused on, on electrification with uh, you know, one, uh, one or two exceptions. Um, but the, you know, the money comes, flows back over you know, a number of years. So uh, in order to really have an appreciable impact on, on our buildings, um, this needs to be multiples of this. Um, Stu had applied for a loan from the USDA in order to fund a bigger loan program and uh, we were turned down for that. Uh, so this is what we feel um, is, is affordable within the current electric fund. Um, I did put in the, in the, in the last paragraph, uh, the possibility of, um, um, you know, some extra um, de financial design that would allow a uh, potential positive interest rate and then uh, sale of loan participations in the future that would recycle the money faster. Because as you know, if you're lending out money over a certain number of years, you can't use that money again until it flows back in. But if somebody is willing to take on those uh, those participations, then th that could recycle loans much faster. In conversations with uh, Adam, um, we uh, arrived at the conclusion that that's it's probably not necessary to do that at this point because we don't we haven't demonstrated the the demand for the program. But uh, once, if and when we do, we we show that there is a lot of demand for the program, then uh, that might be something that we uh, go for if. We don't have other sources of, of, of funding it. I mean, there's a bit of a chicken and egg with the historical numbers. It's not been something that's been heavily promoted. It's been something that's been offered uh, and you can find it on the website, but it's, uh, it's difficult. Um, you have to know where to look. Um, and, um, but it is something that's offered as, the, as our city's energy analyst goes out and does uh, visits to homes and uh, sees, offers an alternative of, a, of an incentive, a cash rebate or, a, or uh, loan. Um, so we, we believe that there could be a bigger uptake, um, but that's an untested proposition. And uh, I think uh, Adam felt it was, a, was prudent, and I, I agree with him that it's prudent to start at this level and, uh, and then demonstrate that there's demand, and then we'll see how to ramp it up. It's a bit of a long story, but I thought that, I thought that it would be useful to, to share all of that thinking that went behind it. Thanks for the question. Uh, a quick question for you, Bob. Um, you know, this seems like uh, an, a uh, carbon offset project. I mean, like, you know, we're describing it in a different way, but effectively it is a carbon offset project. And I don't know if there's any way of, um, of marketing it in that way. <laughs> that is a very interesting idea. I've never thought of it in those terms. Stu, do you have any thoughts about that? Or Tanya? Or Tanya? There's... You know, I think that the current program makes its own argument uh, without adding that complication. I think that might be something to consider if we get past second base. Yeah, I'm happy to complicate it later. Yeah, I, I understood. Maybe I misunderstood what you were, were, were intending, uh, Julian. I understood that you were intending that as a funding mechanism that we would yes. sell offsets. Um, uh, and that's that's an interesting idea. That That's something that certainly would be available in the well, I don't know. We'd have to do certain accounting, certain carbon accounting uh, uh, beforehand, and you know, business as usual and incremental reductions uh, in order to really capture that. So there is some bells and whistles that would have to be added, and then we'd have to decide, you know, whether they're certified emission reductions or whether they're just on the, you know, the in more informal market. Um, so there is some, there are some costs associated with, with putting that together. Yeah. Interesting idea. Very interesting, creative idea. Yeah. Um, I don't, Rick, do you call on people or do I call on people? Um, it's actually easier if you just drive this whole section of the agenda. Okay, okay. thank you. I was, I've been waiting for you, but I, uh, I'll do that. Uh, Tanya had her hand up. Yeah, Stu, we, we have some sort of offset program, right, at the city. I know it's come up um, before. 
And I'm just, yeah. uh, because I, I think we're always looking for some sort of funding mechanism. And um, th th I think there's potential there, but, but what do we already have in place? Yeah, so what exists is basically a way for ratepayers to purchase their own carb carbon offsets from Bonneville Environmental Foundation. And we get an accounting of that, um, but it's not a really active program. Um, it's probably not even the direction that would push most people to go, but we do have it. It is an offering. Um, it's, you know, we may, need, we may need to renew our agreement with them. It's, it's a significant, it's a pretty old program. Um, but that's not the same as selling or monetizing our own offsets uh, within a jurisdiction. That would be a different, pro um, different project entirely. Um, one, the other thing we do get uh, is we get a share of uh, renewable energy certificates from uh, BPA as part of our purchase from them. Uh, but that also, uh, you know, that's sort of a pre-existing thing that doesn't affect ratepayers directly. We can't monetize that to them. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there's a couple of places. One is the city offsetting its own emissions, but then there's the people in the community. But, to, you know, is there a way to do some sort of a program that maybe isn't as formal, but yep. where, where people could contribute into a revolving loan fund? Potentially. I mean, we can, it's really like a blank canvas for us, you know, uh, the question is, what are we trying to accomplish and how much complexity and cost does it add? Um, you know, for most average people, I would push them more in the direction of direct emissions reduction rather than purchasing offsets, um, because that keeps the money local and, you know, they're just different benefits. Uh, typically, I would say benefits are most useful for uh, especially big companies who have no other way of reducing emissions or for atoning for their eco sins. Um, but for the majority of people, uh, you know, it's personal preference, of course, but a lot of people prefer to do a direct project that will reduce emissions rather than purchase some external offset. So what you're saying is like Avista, for example, like they could put several million dollars into this program to partially offset their emissions, and then we could use that to electrify the city. Uh, I can't speak to what a Vista might want to do. That's, 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 that's the proposals coming up. <laughs> Ray, is that, go ahead, um, Ray. Uh, since the residential energy analyst is so important, uh, does funding for that position depend on this program or that's independent? So that's going to. Yeah, well, this program would rely on that person. Uh, yes. A lot of the funding for that comes from our BPA conservation uh, efforts. Okay. So that's, that's, that's something to consider. Uh, you know, part of the one of the unseen benefits of being a BPA customer is we do get some administrative support, and that is one. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And then, Bob, you also had uh, energy storage um, possibly in the future. Um, what are some of the concerns of adding that, or are there concerns for adding that? I can speak to that, Bob. I'm okay. Fire, though. Go, um, go ahead. Go ahead, Stu. One the, you know, one of the concerns is that it's not. A, you know, you do increase resiliency with energy storage, but you don't necessarily increase uh, overall electrification. Right. Um, so, you know, it is a benefit. We do want people to uh, be. Uh, enabled to do those kinds of expensive upgrades that they might not otherwise do. But the benefit to the, um, you know, the ROI to the utility is maybe less defensible than say uh, getting people to electrify an appliance. Um, yeah, but I, I, think, I think I kind of agree. You know, yeah. if uh, you have limited money, would you rather have more people do the energy efficiency upgrades in their house rather than get a storage? Right, but the other thing is that, that we just currently don't have a program for that. And so the, a lot of the other things we do. Um, and so that's part of the reason it's kind of on the someday maybe list. Okay. Gary? You know, Bob, I think, you know, the commission is uh, committed to ensuring equitability among in all things that we do. And from my understanding of our discussion last month is that this program generally excludes rental units and renters. And it seems to me that we need to figure out how to solve that part of this because 
Otherwise, we're just simply ratcheting up the lack of affordability in Ashland. And if we can figure out a way to cut that part of it off in some way or another, um, it seems to me it would serve our community well. Um, the other thing that I noticed in reviewing what had been written is that um, seemingly the eligibility process requires a contractor to be involved in order to complete the process. And I know that many of the retrofit incentive programs that are on the books today allow homeowners to undertake those improvements and still be eligible. Uh, I think personally that that's a good component of the current programs that I would like to see retained. And then finally, um, you know, it, given that we have, um, you know, a limited amount of money to invest in this, I wonder whether there is reason to have, you know, a, a targeting towards lower income households as contrasted to the entire community. Um, I just recently upgraded a number of my appliances and um, I feel that those incentives were important, but at the same time, um, targeting it to those people most in need seems again to help in our drive for equity. So those are three things. Great, Thank, thanks, Gary. I'll take a. I'll take a. Uh, let me start with the last one. I'm going to turn to Stu for the uh, the homeowner uh, owned the, the homeowner um, homeowner's own installation. Uh, installation. But on the uh, targeting, I agree, I agree completely. And the the intention here is to uh, not restrict, but this is mostly this is much more um, much more attractive to to a low income homeowner. Uh, the other than because currently what happens is the if you if you are want to make a switch like you just as have just done you could either have an incentive a cash rebate or you could take a zero interest loan and the thinking behind the city talking with city staff is that um, most people who can afford to shell out the cash up front um, will prefer to take a rebate uh, instead of uh, financing for a number of years at even at zero interest, if the financial return on that is probably not worth uh, as much as the as the cash incentive, um, this actually does it gives an extra twist on that. It allows low income uh, homeowners to do both to to get the rebate and take a loan, so they don't have to forego the rebate, but just because they're taking a zero interest loan, so that makes it much more. Um, much more affordable, frankly, to to a, a, an income constrained uh, homeowner. So, it, it, totally in line with what you're what you're what you're saying, uh, without actually restricting this only to to low income uh, um, homeowners. Um, on the first point, on renters, you know, it's a tough nut to crack. Um, that's why we we didn't get there uh, on this go round. The current programs, as you know, don't uh, aren't eligible. Um, to, to, to renters. Um, there are some complications of trying to do it to, to, for, um, um, for landowners or landlords. Um, we did extend this to ADUs, um, which is a type of um, benefit to a, to a certain type of, of renter, but for multifamily, larger multifamily complexes, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit more uh, challenging to, to make sure that happens, but it, and it would also require significantly more resources, as you as you can imagine. Uh, but yes, so it's are, definitely on the radar screen. And uh, so, are there should we get into are, it? are there communities out there that are extending this kind of program to rental households that are yeah, maybe under the BPA system? Yeah. Talk yeah. To Part of what the problem is, is it's a structural problem in that these are, these are home upgrades and renters don't pay for those, um, but they do typically pay the utility bill. So there's a disconnect between the people who put the machinery in and those who pay the long-term sure. um, energy cost of it. And so it's the same thing that we've talked about very often, the best choice if, you, if you're taking the lifetime cost 
um, is to do the energy efficient space. But if it's if those two costs are being borne by different people, then typically the homeowner or the landlord is going to want the cheapest upfront costs, which then affect the the tenants. And it's, this is you know I go to a number of conferences and people have just been gnashing their teeth around this problem because it's hard to line the incentives up because of this disconnect. And um, and so I think I think it makes sense for us to keep moving and, and expanding this and figuring out how do we reach those low income homeowners. But the reality in Ashland is that most of our low income people are going to be living in apartments. You know, very few low income people own homes in Ashland unless they bought them a long, long time ago. And so it's there's sort of a structural issue that that we need to figure out, um, probably with landlords, once we get this up and running in a bigger way. Um, I, I'd like to inject one suggestion here. Uh, the split incentive problem is a, a well-known problem throughout this universe. Uh, the uh, place that I know of that has most directly attacked this has been in the context of commercial property, but RMI in Boulder uh, uh, has a set of documents where they uh, have at least a framework for how you deal with this split incentive problem. So I, I'd suggest that that's a resource that ought to be explored. Thanks, Rick. Stu? We can tag on to that just to say that, you know, both the city of Boulder does have a good program that they've developed to address this. Uh, but the, the downside of that program is that it requires um, regulation uh, and staffing and compliance. And so with those tools, I think it's pretty easy to put uh, rental energy codes in place. Uh, in lieu of that kind of enforcement, um, there's very little that we can do to make people do it. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to provide incentives to the building owner, uh, but then it's hard to prevent them from increasing the rent uh, because it's now a more desirable, more efficient property. Uh, so there really needs to be a way to control both the investments and the rents. Um, and I think some of the larger cities have been successful in this, um, but it's been all through regulation and compliance. Um, there are other pathways for voluntary adoption, uh, and we certainly have room to exercise those here. Um, but it may require some political capital to get to the rental market. Well, there's political capital, but there's <clears throat> the other mechanism is contractual commitments that have a relatively long lifespan. Uh, contract. Anyway, I, I just wanted to raise that uh, as a put, put possible path. I, I don't want to belabor it right now. I think uh, what you're proposing is reasonable place to start, and we obviously need to expand it both in how much money there is and the applicability to more buildings, uh, and particularly with an equity lens. Um, so at this point, what I'm wondering is uh, what uh, the group that worked on this is looking for from the commission. There, there was one more. There was one more question. It was Gary's question about homeowner installation. So I don't know if uh, Stu could just answer that uh, quickly, and then we'll we'll answer your question, Rick. Yeah, briefly, I wouldn't totally rule it out, but it seems uh, problematic in the sense that we won't be able to quality control it, uh, and that the upgrades wouldn't be bonded and insured, and uh, most of these require uh, permits for plumbing or electrical. So. Um, I would say it's possible, but given the fact that we are doing an incremental increase to an existing program, it's probably not, we're probably not gonna rewrite the rules for that. Um, if we do a $10 million loan to do a much larger program, I think, you know, sky's the limit. Yeah, well, the, the fact of the matter is, is, as you said, that a building permit is required. So that in essence serves as the quality control, right? I mean, that's, the assurance that we have, we wouldn't give an incentive think, where someone didn't take out a building permit. Yeah, I mean, I, this is probably a conversation we should take up um, down the road, considering the time. Okay, great. Um, so let's see, Stu, I, you know, this is, do we need the do we need a thumbs up? Do we need a motion? What do we What do we need from the commission on this? This is something that the city already offers. It's a It's a It's a change, a modest change to the to the existing program. It's an increase in the program. 
um, what, what's most helpful for, for the- Well, and, and the other thing I'm wondering is whether this can be entirely driven by staff or whether this needs to go through council. Uh, it does not need to go to council. This is an existing program that we're just tweaking how we run it. Um, so what would be helpful, I guess, is a vote of support, or if you would like to put together a motion and, or a statement, uh, I'd be, you know, recommend to staff that, 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 that. But, you know, thumbs up is good too. It's, I think, your comfort level, Bob. I move the commission endorse the, uh, the plan that uh, Bob and Stu has put forward this evening. And, and Tanya and Brigitte. <laughs> uh, there's been a motion. Is there a second? Uh, Julian, I think you, I saw your hand go up first. Yeah, uh, I was first. Any further discussion? Good plan. Okay, uh -huh. all in favor? Yeah, unanimous. Thank you. Okay, so Bob, you're done? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the CEEP update. Uh, as I was proposing in the chair memo, what I'd like to do is to start uh, by looking at the goals chapter. Uh, <clears throat> just to set context, uh, it is the case that uh, what I was intending when I wrote the template uh, is not been uh, universally uh, accepted or understood or, or, or whatever and propagated through the other chapters. And so I'd like to use the goals chapter as a representation of what I had intended with the thought that would inspire uh, commission discussion about whether what I intended is what the commission actually wants to do. Um, and so that as the uh, first step, uh, let me bring up uh, chapter two, I believe. Sure. Okay, so uh, the thought was that we are writing a document that could be uh, the source both for it in its entirety, uh, but also uh, to create a short document, then that's the five or 10 page document uh, by simply taking the description sections out of each chapter, uh, slamming them all together, and then that's the five or 10 page document with the intention that the uh, description sections are intended for people that uh, don't care about the ucky details and don't want rationalizations. They just want to know what's the plan. <clears throat> and uh, hopefully that will uh, help them understand what it is they can do. Um, and so it would uh, form a basis for a unified uh, public outreach, um, not just for CBC, but hopefully for CCOC and community organizations and that sort of thing. Uh, so I, it, it was quite clear from the submissions that I, I didn't make that clear. Uh, and so I, I wanted to try to make that more clear. And so the description section you see in the goals and actions portion is a reduction of what you then see in the rationale section, uh, which does get into uh, history and motivations and how we're going to do things and that sort of thing. And so the intention uh, was for that recipe to be followed in all of the chapters. Um, so I guess I'd like to stop there and see if uh, that makes sense to the rest of you or if there's any commentary. Um, so Rick, I took a, a stab at it, but uh, like all things, you need an editor that uh, can steer you back in the right direction. So I, I think like you said earlier, it is an iterative process. Um, and then the other thing that I struggled with is that a lot of these sections, there are commonalities between different sections. So how do we cross-reference something in uh, the energy utility that also impacts transportation or the uh, building sector or something? That, that was a little uh, confusing to me about how we would handle that. Okay. Well, let me take, if you have more, that's fine, but let me take them one at a time because I won't remember what you asked otherwise. 
the uh, plan that I had was that each author would be expansive at this point in the uh, document creation process and not worry too much about whether what they're saying uh, overlaps with what somebody else says. Uh, and that would be followed by a reduction exercise, uh, principally driven by the editor, which is currently me. Uh, and so that, that's how it would unfold. So did that answer your question? Okay. Yes. So I'll, I'm waiting for that first iteration. Uh, you have to tell me whether you want more or less or you know, point me in the right direction. And, and uh, as long as uh, this tonight's outcome is as I'm hoping, uh, that is my intent. Uh, but I didn't want to uh, sink a lot of effort into it uh, in, in advance of having us all moving forward together. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm not hearing any objection or questions about what the intent is between those two sections. Uh, I want to move on to the rationale uh, because there is some substantial uh, policy implications of what I wrote in the rationale. And I want to be sure uh, that I'm not going entirely out into the weeds and uh, that the commission uh, is supportive of the direction it's going or wants to establish a new direction. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the first uh, item of significant policy choice is that the seat 2017 uh, talked about reducing 8% per year uh, from a 2015 baseline. And I go on uh, in the goal achievement versus time uh, section of this chapter, uh, showing what that means numerically. And uh, I believe that this sets us up for failure uh, because we can't reduce uh, at that rate, particularly given the context that we are now operating in almost four years later. Uh, so I guess I'd like to see uh, some indication of whether everybody understands that that's impossible or whether there's anybody that thinks that, that that's the path we need to be on. It's somehow we have to uh, get down to 43% uh, of that baseline in four years. Not here. Julian? It sort of, it does, I wonder if there's a way of calculating what the actual maximum rate of decrease might be. I mean, of course, like everything that we're doing, most of which is very uncertain, is what determines the rate of, of decrease. And so, um, you know, there's a there's a um, there's a huge unknown. But like, what does it actually mean to decrease our fossil fuel consumption by forty three percent? I don't know. By I'm sorry, by whenever it is, fifty percent by twenty thirty. Like, how much fossil fuels are we consuming, for example? Yes. Uh, well, let me speak to the uh, general point, uh, which is how do we know where we are and how, how do we know what we can reasonably plan to get to? Uh, the theory that I have is that we need to state what our implementation plan is, including the specific measurements, and then have a discussion about what we realistically think we can achieve doing that. that uh, the C2017 had aspirational goals, and, and it's good to have those aspirational goals, particularly for the ones further out in time that are consistent with uh, the rest of the world. Uh, <clears throat> but for actually implementing uh, reductions and holding ourselves to account, we need to have a concrete step-by-step -step plan that uh, measures our local emissions and can measure uh, the reductions. We don't yet have such a plan. Uh, and so one of the outcomes I'm hoping for by going through the exercise of writing this update is to uh, have a much more definitive plan uh, that we will then hold, our, hold ourselves accountable to and that it be something that we can realistically hold ourselves accountable to. Right, and I don't want to say that we don't have any quantification of Ashland's um, 
greenhouse gas emissions because we did try to quantify them back in 2015, I think it was too, or 14, I can't remember. And maybe it wasn't a complete um, inventory, but anyway, there was one done. I think emissions have increased since then, but anyhow, there was at least some attempt to quantify them a while back. Yes, and I'd like to address that as well. Uh, the model that was used uh, for the 2015 baseline uses uh, correlation models that use statistics over time and uh, geographic area uh, that are not uh, precise, as is implied uh, by the single digit percentages that are in that pie chart in C2017. So I, I think that was a reasonable place to start. That's where many communities start. Uh, and there are good reasons to, to continue to use those sorts of models for reporting out to uh, other uh, consumers of that information. Uh, but it's not terribly useful for understanding exactly what's going on in Ashland and how we're going to reduce it. For that, uh, we need to uh, change to a causal model rather than a correlation model where we actually identify where the emissions are coming from and then come up with a plan for uh, dealing with them in turn. And I, I believe that the outline of uh, the update uh, is moving towards uh, breaking things down by specific emission sources uh, and uh, identifying the authors who are going to create a plan to deal with that emission source. Does that make all sense to you? Yes. Ray? Yeah, there's always some uncertainty too. It's almost like the goal will have to work backwards in terms of what we can measure and what we're doing and then set a realistic goal. And we can compare that to the one in SEEP 2017 and we'll have to explain, you know, the difference. But I agree, we're trying to get more to a, a causal, causal model. And I think, Stu, you've probably got a list of things that we can measure and uh, so we'll have to start with that and see how big of the pie do we cover with those measurements and how much is still gonna be unknown. For example, consumption. That's a third of the pie we probably are not gonna be able to get our hands on that exists out there. So uh, there's a question whether we would include that in this update or not, but I really like the idea of let's get a hand on things we can measure and start doing actions and, see, and, and start measuring. Yes, I completely agree. Uh, Gary, I think you had your hand up next. Yeah, Ray basically said what I was going to say. I think, you know, the conclusion or the assumption that you're making, Rick, is probably true, but I think we should let this implementation plan work its thing and we'll give it our best guess as to what accomplishment we can actually do in 2025 and 2030 and all those intermediate years. But I think that should be driven by the work that we're doing now, rather than forecasting what we might be able to do. Yes, yeah, so I'm not proposing that we uh, set those uh, interim targets or final targets uh, prior to doing the plan. They need to be the outcome of the plan rather than the uh, input to it. Precisely. By the way, uh, I know this is gonna sound silly, but it's not meant to be. So the difference between whatever our goals were and whatever we're actually accomplishing, that could be perhaps turned into a dollar amount and put into the home energy retrofit loan in the form of carbon offset. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> okay, so uh, Jeff. Um, so to use a concrete example, the transportation sector, and I don't remember the numbers, but that's maybe a quarter of the, uh, the carbon emissions in Ashland. To meet some of these goals, that means that by 2030, we would have needed to transition maybe 50, 75% of the fleet to electric. So, I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about. And that's a big, big challenge. Or, you know, to eliminate hot water, natural gas, hot water heaters in, in all of the city, 
that's what we're talking about, right? How we have a road plan, a, a roadmap to get there. That's ambitious. Right. That's and so those numbers represent the graph in SEEP 2017. Uh, and what I'm proposing is that we not think about those numbers right now, but rather create a plan that will bring emissions down as rapidly as we think is humanly possible and, and, and then compute what those percentages will be. Good plan. Good. Uh, Chris? I think um, I really like your, your adaptation progress indicator. Uh, section as well. I think that's very important there, you know, because not everything is quantitative data either. There's, there's has to be some opportunity to track, um, you know, obviously developing social currents and instances that, that are unforeseen. Um, just right off the top, I think unhoused population is a, is a big factor of that, which, which does also have very real data. Um, that's something I'm going to speak to a little bit later. And, um, that obviously is is part of our task as well, right? It's 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 not just strictly carbon emissions, but it's everything that also, um, you know, uh, leads to those carbon emissions in, in terms of our society. And, and I think that that's a that's a very valid aspect of this. Okay. Um... I'd like to get back on track on, on the agenda. So we only have a few more minutes for this topic. Uh, uh, what I'm hearing so far is that the general uh, approach that's suggested by what was written in the goals and actions chapter uh, is a consensus. And if it's not, now's the time to say something. Uh, I'm not sure, I think Bob and then uh, Tonya. It was Tonya first. Okay, Tanya first. Um, I actually would like to make a run at the other side of this because of the 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 warning from the IPCC. We actually have a deadline, and we have numbers that we have to hit. Um, it's it's kind of like you think about like kind of coming up to one of those big ravines in the movies where they have the big you know the creek at the bottom and the river at the bottom. We need to build a thirty foot bridge but we don't know how to build a 30 foot bridge. So does it make any sense at all for us to build the bridge we know how to build, which is maybe only 15 feet, right? I mean, we have an actual number we have to get to. And um, the fact that we don't know how to get there, I think doesn't change where we have to get. And, and I would be concerned that if what we do is build a plan around what we, what we think we can hit, that we actually lose the fact that that we're not doing what is necessary. And, and I also think about it in terms of the fact that it's one carbon budget. Ashland's doing a lot more work than a lot of other communities our size, right? So even in that sense, it, there, you know, we can't even be sure that hitting our numbers in Ashland gets us where we need to be globally, so. It seems like there's, there's two things you need to do. You need to figure out how to build your 15 foot bridge and measure all that stuff. And then you also need to figure out how to get the other 15 feet built. I mean, the 50, we can get 15 feet with stuff. Maybe we can get 15 feet with stuff we know how to do already. Uh, but I think, I think it's still worth knowing that we still have 15 more feet to go. And I'm kind of serious about the idea of the carbon offsets, you know, internal carbon offsets. Because in a way, if you really want to build the 30 foot bridge, all of the city's resources ought to be put towards shutting down our methane consumption to start with. Well, and I think the other piece of it is that, that we have a time limit, right? I mean, yes. and the time limit is the is what drove that 8% number in the first place. Yeah, so, I don't, anybody who disagrees with that, uh, I think we're all uh, <clears throat> incredibly aware of how far behind the world is on this thing and we're highly motivated or we wouldn't be spending our time working on a commission like this. So I, I appreciate that you, you, it's important to mention what you just said every time, Tanya, um, but uh, I don't think it's worth spending a whole lot of time discussing it because I think we're all uh, frighteningly aware of it. I wouldn't change the SEEP 2017 goals, right? I'd keep those in place. This is an implementation plan. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, I mean, and we should. That, so maybe that's where I should jump in because yeah. I was next. You were but, actually next. <laughs> I was I was next. Thanks, thanks, Ray. I mean, I, I, you know, I think I think the 2017 SEEP is pretty good. I think the goals are pretty good. I've you know I spent a lot of time with it, and we've got a pretty strong implementation plan. I've looked at the Pierce County uh, sample that Rick you sent, and I you know we can always debate a lot of different things, a lot of different measures and a lot of different approaches and strategies and ways of presenting something. But my God, I, I just, you know, I think we know where we need to go. I think the 2017 plan says where we need to go. We may quibble with, you know, this kind of graph that goes, you know, this mathematical way of representing it. But frankly, I think it gives us the entree to just do what we think needs to be done and we're doing it. Uh, we need to do more. We need to do it more urgently. I, I, I think we should stick with where we're going and just work on the implementation plan. And what I really liked about this, um, of all of this that I saw, I mean, I thought, the, I thought the adaptation section was the thing that's really new and necessary. And I appreciate the, the time that Tanya spent doing that um, because I think that was something that was clearly underdeveloped in the, in the seat. But for the rest of it, um, I have to say, I think that it's, we could, spend a fascinating time talking about all this and maybe over a drink or two or more, but it's just not, it's not my, going back to your original question, it delays us, distracts us from doing other things that I think we uh, just need to be doing. So I would, I would not put effort into doing this uh, SEEP update um, and all of the work that that would take. I would just get on with the implementation plan, tweak some of the, the implementation me plan measures and go back and track it with the indicators that Stu has developed and add more indicators if that's necessary and give more prominence to that set of indicators. Has, that, has everybody here seen the presentation that Stu gave to the city council back in April and all of those, uh, you know, they're, it's pretty detailed. It's got a lot of Detail. It it tells us where we've gone, where we're going astray, and is an opportunity for us to really redouble our efforts there, and also to engage with the with the council uh, on on those kinds of points. We've not really taken advantage of it for a lot of different reasons because of COVID and you know everything else. But I think we've got the elements we need. I just full speed ahead with implementation. No more plans. Okay. Well, and speaking of the tension between planning and implementation, in case I wasn't, in case I wasn't uh, provocative enough for you. Well, so that that is a, a tension. Uh, I personally have a lot to say about it, and I suspect it could you go on with some discussion. But we have run out of time for this agenda item, uh, and so uh, I don't even want to respond to you right now, Bob. Not because I think it's unimportant, but because I don't want to spend the time on it right now. Okay, so I just want to make sure that it's so I, I just I said all of that and I said it with a fair amount of con, uh, conviction and strength because I want it to be clear that it is not a consensus. I'm not for me. This is not a consensus. Uh, got it. Uh, so <laughs> I think I want to take a comment from Gary and then what I am intending to do is still to uh, come back with a limited amount of time for this topic at the next meeting. Uh, Would, Gary, mm, try to thinking about how we might move forward is a motion to postpone updated the seat for five years of help to us as a commission. That way, we aren't mm -hmm. dealing with the seat update. We're dealing with an implementation plan, which I consider to be a crucial priority for us. We've lacked that. That's why we have made as little progress of, as we have. We need to know what we're doing. Right, and that would be uh, the beginning of my uh, response to Bob's comments. Uh, okay. But I, I don't want to do that tonight because there are uh, several implementation things that I really want to get to. Uh, and so if the commission is okay with bringing this back for further discussion for a limited period of time at the next meeting, uh, that's what I'd like to do. So uh, is, is everybody okay with doing that? Or, or do we need to continue on with what we're well, Ray, 
uh, again, your memo said we wanted to focus on implementation and SEEP would take a back seat. And then you also gave us several options how we should proceed with SEEP. So I think people should think about that and we should bring it back at the next meeting. Okay, well, I think we've got uh, over half the people so it's just suggesting that we should spend time at the next meeting. So I'd like to just leave it at that yep. uh, and move on to the next topic. Uh, <clears throat> the next one is uh, a Vista communication, uh, Ray. Yeah, I hope you all had a chance to read our feedback um, to a Vista. Um, Rick's got my name down here, but he did most of the work. Um, together, we uh, ended up with this draft and we felt that it was important for him uh, to understand the position of the city of Ashland is really, uh, we don't want, uh, we kind of want to cease uh, in, in, um, increasing the amount of uh, fossil gas used in, in Ashland. And uh, so we reiterated our role as at the CPC, gave them our position, um, and then we had some short-term and long-term uh, view. Um, Steve did mention that uh, they might get into piping some cleaner fuels, so we would like to see more work done on his end to understand what their plan is, but uh, short-term, uh, we also don't think that we should be uh, renewing uh, fossil fuel appliances um, and we'd like to phase them out. So we want uh, basically to make sure he gets our position. And then longer term, uh, it's still TBD, uh, whether or not they'll be able to have uh, replace 100% with a renewable gas um, the, the only plans I've seen is sort of a hybrid model where they still have fossil gas and they put hydrogen or renewable methane in with it. Uh, we don't really like that idea either. And then towards the end, uh, Rick uh, sort of gave, gave them another position. Uh, maybe they would help us with electrification since uh, this is also involved with electrical outside of uh, Ashland. And uh, and we still look forward to working with them, uh, but we want him to uh, know our position. So I welcome any feedback uh, people have on that. Yeah, and, and let me uh, make one uh, sort of point of order here. Uh, <clears throat> this memo describes a policy recommendation of the commission that we have never formally approved. And so, uh, if we go forward with approving this motion, we are implicitly stating that policy. And I just want to make sure everybody's clear that we're making a significant policy statement uh, by approving this memo. Uh, Jeff? Um, that was precisely my question. And I was going to preface it by saying I support that policy rec recommendation. So maybe we should formalize it. Yeah, I, I would uh, be seeking a motion to formalize the policy recommendation uh, and have the memo approved separately. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? Up, oh, Stu? Yeah, pre-motion, uh, just, I think this is probably clear, but because of Vista is a business partner of the city, this will have to be transmitted through admin, not directly from the commission, but I don't think that's a problem. I just wanted to make sure everyone is on the same page with that. Uh, Julian? I don't know that there's a whole lot to be gained by telling Avista that we don't want to want their product. I mean, I think it's sort of implicit in what we're doing in a way. I don't know that there's a whole lot of purpose in telling them that we don't want it. Gary? I do feel like the memo is trying to pick up fight with Avista, one that we don't really need to have right now and one that basically they've got the authority to continue to deliver natural gas in the city for the foreseeable future, unless we, as a community, change that policy. And I'm not sure that it advances our cause by making Avista feel like they're in a 
in a fight, basically. And I'm done. Well, I, I don't see the benefits, I guess, in doing I this. Think Gary, I think, understand it. part of the reasoning was to, uh, and again, this is the climate policies um, recommendation, um, to have a VISTA understand where other cities are going similarly, what are they going to have for future plans? I, I think they, they and, and they yeah. understand, I think Avista knows better than we do where they stand and what their business plan, ha how their business plan has to change. I don't think they need our input to do that. Well, I think uh, we, I, I think our best bet is plowing ahead, figuring out how we actually turn off the valve and reduce the in installation of gas fired appliances. That's our work. Well, it's I, not... you know, let, let me respond to that uh, thread. Uh, my take on the situation when uh, Steve was here is that he was uh, soliciting us to give customer feedback to his management for exactly these issues because it helps him raise those issues within the Vista, that it's not just some uh, Looney Tunes people in Eugene that are going after this uh, with Northwest Natural. It's also their direct customers that are looking at this and will have impact on their business as fast as we can make it happen. And to uh, try to sweep it under the rug or act, we're not picking a fight here. I, I, I mean, if you wanna change the tone or the tenor, that's fine. Uh, but the, the facts of the situation, I don't think should be avoided. I don't think we have to avoid them. I think it'll be self-evident by our ratcheting down methane use. Yes, uh, but by putting it into a memo that goes to the customer representative who could then present it to his uh, boss and his boss's bosses and all the way up the chain, I, I believe that that is actually serving both Avista as a corporation as well as uh, the community of Ashland. I don't want to serve Avista. Well, I, I don't uh, agree with that. Uh, I, these corporations employ a lot of people. Uh, they're important to their communities. And I think it is best for us to build a positive relationship with them and work as closely as we can to achieve our mutual goals. Uh, Stu? Yeah, I was just gonna say something similar that I think it's important to maintain the communication and you know, not try to burn the bridge uh, right away. There are things we could do to tone down this communication if indeed we wanna send it. Um, Another possibility would be simply to invite them back to speak on a more specific topic of uh, carbon intensity reduction. And like, we want to understand better what their plans are uh, and leave it to them to tell us. Um, I think that that might be a more neutral way to go. Um, you know, in any case, this letter is now part of the public record and I don't think the sentiment can be covered up, but what we actually do as a commission, uh, I think, could have repercussions. So we should, you know, just consider that as we go. Jeff? Um, if our goal is to uh, stop uh, natural gas connections, new natural gas connections in the short term, the city could obviously do that through regulation, I'm assuming, or maybe not, so. but can the gas company do that for us? Why would they do that for us? I, I don't think, I think they were required to provide service on an uh, e even-handed basis. I don't think they can actually just stop making connections. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated topic of both in the short term and the long term. And the intent is to engage them in further conversation about what actually can be done. Um, we're, we have run out of time uh, for this topic. Uh, <clears throat> what I would like is for those who, who uh, feel like this should say something different because I do want to send something to them. Uh, I'd like for them to volunteer to take another cut at it uh, and bring it back at the next meeting. Is, is there anybody that wants to do that? I'll uh, do Julian? it with Julian. I'll do it with Julian. Okay, Julian and Gary uh, have an action item to, to bring a revised memo for the next meeting. Okay, so I, I'd like to move on. Uh, the next topic is highly related. Uh, Julian wrote 
a uh, document about natural gas emissions reductions. And so, Julian, you're on. So I think, so my goal from, I think the first meeting at the very first part of it was to turn off the natural gas to the city of Ashland. Um, there, you know, we're all very aware of climate change issues and greenhouse gas emissions and all that sort of thing. But I think by and large, people in Ashland are actually not very aware of these things. And most people still think that methane is a wonderful fuel that's very climate friendly and is, you know, the bridge to the future where we're all going to have a happy ending. Um, and so, although we don't focus on this very much, I think educating the people in Ashland to the realities of natural gas, like the just chemical sort of um, effects of natural gas, the global warming potential is a high priority in my opinion. And so this um, basically has, this is a plan really for educating the group, the uh, Ashland residents. And it's relatively simple. And the first item on the list, I don't, I didn't write a motion, but I was wondering if there is a way of having a motion to support bringing this first item to city council. The first item is that we, it would be very helpful if the city actually published out the city's natural gas consumption on the landing page of the city's website, which would uh, be an indication of how important the city felt this issue was. And we do collect the, we already collect the uh, total amount of gas consumed by the city because we, um, our franchise agreement depends on that number. And our, you know, the, our compensation for that is based on that number. And so the number already exists. I think it would be very valuable and uh, potentially change uh, the city's perspective substantially if that number were actually published on the city's website. In addition, it's a very easy thing to measure as it goes down or goes up potentially and has many other, or, you know, has several other, I think, valuable uh, uh, knock-on effects. And so I don't know if there's a way of turning this into a motion that the group could potentially support, the motion being something to the effect of, we move to uh, request the city council instruct staff to publish the total consumption of natural gas in the city uh, on the city's landing page, something to that effect. Uh, I don't know, is there a, is that? Uh, I, think, I think Stu raised his hand to the comment. Yeah, well, I'd like to say, uh, first of all, the city only gets these numbers quarterly. Uh, so that would be the absolute fastest that it could be done um, as, you know, as part of our quarterly franchise reporting. Uh, the other thing is we do publish this. Um, I've put it in every single annual report that I've done, 10-year uh, natural gas trends. Um, but what, in my experience, uh, the amount of therms means basically nothing to the general public. Uh, I think the proposal under the current progress indicators uh, of the SEEP update document is to translate that into relative um, GHGs, uh, which if we look at the GHGs of natural gas versus the GHGs of BPA power, uh, it becomes uh, much more intuitive uh, where we need to take action. Uh, that's never been presented in the previous GHG reporting format. This is something that we're talking about doing differently uh, as part of this current SEEP update. Uh, I think it'll be much better and more intuitive. Um, so I don't disagree with the intent here, but I don't think publishing the number of therms is really going to move anybody. Personally, that's my experience. Um, that that's all. Yuri. Oh, it seems like this would be a natural thing to include in the city's climate page that we just reviewed. The uh, Bridget distributed. Um, having a section on relative greenhouse gas emissions from different sources, our progress on reducing those emissions from natural gas and keeping that updated would serve, I think, as a pretty good tool to track and to explain the issues. That's the plan. So the plan is that that will be published on the city's landing page? The plan is that once I update the progress indicators that they will find a home on the new website. Um, I, I can't speak to the frequency of updating. Um, like I said, we only get that quarterly and typically I only have the bandwidth to do a big GHG update every year. 
Um, and in fact, uh, because of COVID and whatnot, we're behind schedule on that. So once we get the website up uh, and hopefully not too far after, I should have the new indicators to put there. But the plan is that this will be on the climate web part of the website, or this will be on the, the front page that people start with on the city? It should be on the climate section. Well, I would advocate for it being on the front page, kind of more or less in the center of the front page, personally. I think I saw Bob and uh, Tanya raise their hands. Is that right? Yes, and again, Tanya was first. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just what I saw. No, I know, I know. It's uh, it's hard with all these boxes, but I can see her, and I know when I moved. <laughs> Go ahead, Tanya. Um, uh, I think just the the educational information that you've put together here, Julian, is I think a really important part of what the conversation we need to have, because not only are we wanting people to make these choices in their own homes, maybe with this loan program that we've got going on, but we also want to set the table for other activities. We know that we need to do some sort of a phase out. We know that we need to pass an ordinance that says we're not going to keep building fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, but the community doesn't necessarily understand why those are necessary. And so I think something that starts with helping people understand why methane is not where we wanna get our energy from is an important first step that we can build a lot of different things off of. I don't, I'm not a communications or marketing expert. I don't know where it should go, but I, or how it should look. But I think in, you know, that messaging around methane needs to be a really um, major part of, of what happens. Maybe through the, the Conservation and Climate Outreach Commission. I know SOCAN, the local SOCAN group is doing a lot of public education. I wonder if there's a way to coordinate um, uh, and really do a big push on helping people understand why natural gas isn't where they want to go. Right, but I think that, you know, the city can make a, a bold statement, I suppose you could say. And I do think that putting it on the front page of the city's website is an indication of how high of a priority it is for the city. I mean, you can, it could be buried at the very back of multiple different, um, you know, pathways to get through the website. And that would be an indication of how important the city thought it was too. But if it's right in the middle of the front page, then that clearly indicates to everybody in the city that goes to the website anyway that it's an important issue. So that's my feeling on it. Okay, so there's only a few more minutes left for this particular topic. I'll um, go to two other issues in it if you like. Yeah, so Bob, I, I, I'm going to give you a chance, but uh, after Bob speaks, what I'd like to do is to uh, talk about how the commission is going to move forward, including whatever action items uh, people might take in order to uh, bring this discussion further forward for whenever it next comes up at a future meeting. Okay, Bob. Uh, thanks, thanks, Rick, and thanks, thanks, thank you very much, Julian. I mean, I think this is brilliant um, to to really put this on the table and really start thinking about you know really focusing our attention on on this challenge. And I know you've been saying this for for a year and a half since since I first saw you saw the first commission meeting, but um, uh, but I think it, this does put a finer point on it. And I don't know whether it goes on the landing page. It probably does eventually. I don't know who controls that real estate for the for the city. And there's probably a process. And we should probably figure all that out. Getting the right indicator is I think uh, is important. And I, and I feel confident uh, that Stu is doing that with the next with the next iteration. So I think I support all of that. Um, and I support, you know, going, reading down in your, in your, in your memo as well, using other, and Tanya, Tanya referred to this as well, other community partners who are also focusing on, uh, on this message because people don't get it. You are absolutely right. And, uh, Tanya is absolutely right. And people, you know, this, it's, it, it's not something that's crossed most people's, uh, screen. So that the education piece is, should be a top priority for us. Um, feeding, you know, hand in glove with our policy recommendation. Eventually, I'd like to actually do that. Uh, do a policy recommendation at the at the appropriate time. Uh, in that sequence that, that it was mentioned in the letter to Avista that we would, uh, you know, be seeking to you know, uh, avoid new connections or phase out new connections and then retire our equipment as it gets uh, gets gets phased out. So, um, I think there's a lot of work to do on this. I'm excited that you brought it here. 
I think there's all, I think we can really, we really absolutely need to bring the community along now because it's just not on the radar issue. Just the way everyone talks about it is carbon. And I know he talks about it is methane. <laughs> Nobody talks about it as greenhouse gases even. And that's uh, Alan, Alan Journey's, you know, long nightmare is that people talk about it as carbon instead of greenhouse gas emissions. And that, and in that he's right. <laughs> okay. So, I, in the interest of time, uh, what I'd like is for a selection of commissioners below a quorum that want to work on this uh, to bring something forward that encapsulates all of their thoughts. Uh, are there people who want to volunteer for that? Okay, Julia, Bob, and Tanya is what I, I saw those three hands come up. And Stu wants to work with them, or are you uh, coming? No, just brief comment. Um, I'll keep it very short because I know we're running out of time. But uh, you know, I often defend policy uh, deliberations uh, from the Conservation and Climate Outreach Commission and try to keep them on their outreach task. Uh, similarly, I think if you folks think this is a good idea, I would encourage you to either kick the ball over to them or work alongside them to make it happen. Uh, they're very eager to work with you folks. So I think this may be a good opportunity to do that, but I really wanna make sure the outreach is in firmly camped in the outreach commission and the policy stays here uh, just to keep things clear. Um, but I think this is looks like the initiation of maybe a new policy that could then go to them. So I don't wanna be rigid about it, but I just wanna add that lens. Yes, that, that makes great sense to me, uh, Bob. I don't, I don't need to say anything. I, okay. I, it's fine. Okay. Uh, I, I think we've got so, an, an action item. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, just so I can capture this action item, can someone restate it succinctly for me? I think that Bob, Tanya, and Julian are going to take uh, what Julian has proposed, revise it to include all of their thoughts, and bring it back to the commission at a future meeting. One small uh, caveat to this. So Tanya said that we to get it would be helpful to have things in front of the um, council within three weeks. Uh, and I'd like to try and turn this into something that we can put in front of council as a decision to put this on the landing page of the website within three weeks. So um, maybe I can chime in here. Um, so this list that I'm bringing is my list as a counselor. And, and so what I'm looking for is input here. It, it doesn't have to be um, any particular thing that this commission um, uh, uh, gives a stamp of approval on or passes a motion on. This is essentially my priority list as a counselor. So I can, I can kind of on some level put anything on it I want to put on it um, without, you know, it's, it's not so much the, the commission's um, uh, uh, jurisdiction, if you will, it's a terrible word, but that's the best one I can come up with at the moment. Um, but what I, I have a long list of things here and I can tell you we're not going to get that whole long list in. So I need to do some thinking around it, but I have added it to, to my list of possible things to bring forward in that session. Okay, uh, I think that that is what we're gonna be able to accomplish tonight. Uh, we need to move on. Uh, the next item is residential construction standards, PV reservation, and uh, Chris. Great, I'll be uh, efficient with this. Um, essentially, in looking at PV and solar reservation standards currently within the city, uh, you know, a lot of this has to do with the definition of solar envelope, and um, I included a couple links here into how. Um, solar solar envelope um, modeling and tracking is occurring uh, currently across the country with use of LIDAR data and photogrammetry. Um, I have both those links there. There's There's been some interesting uh, developments with uh, Google Project Sunroof. Um, I'm not sure if I can share a screen here. It looks like it's disabled, but if, if anyone followed those links, you can see there's quite a bit of um, modeling that's been done not in Ashland, but definitely in Medford and the outlying areas, uh, including Phoenix and Jacksonville, um, to the degree where you can actually see um, percentage of efficiency on or 
projected efficiency on roof slopes within that entire metropolitan area. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I don't, I don't know why there hasn't been any work done in Ashland. I don't know if that's um, just a, a, a Google flight plan or if it's something that perhaps Ashland didn't want to endorse, but I think in terms of a metric and, and if you, if you kind of put in our zip code and you go to that, or you actually select Medford, I would recommend and go to that Google front page, you can look at some very valuable solar installation potential there as well, where they're, they're really, they've got some great infographics. Uh, they list all the potential solar incentives for the area and then the methodology for, for calculating that. Um, I just felt like there's some very valuable um, assets here that could possibly be used by the city for, for future analysis and evaluation. Um, however, very succinctly, I, I included a, a proposition for consideration to recommendation um, from CPC to council of a um, two points for subsection 18.4.8050B of the Solar Access Code. Uh, these were proposed in 2015, and I feel like they make steps forward. They're, they're very simple, um, you know, primarily a, a qualitative aspect here to design habitable structures so that primary living spaces rather than those less frequently used, um, such as utility rooms, closets, or garages, um, are located on the south side of buildings that would allow for passive solar gain. And then also, um, habitable structure design for 30% of, of roof area um, facing uh, the south for solar collection. And I, I think those would both be a great step in the right direction in this regard. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm excited about it as an architect because I just see a lot of what we call BIM, uh, building information modeling, uh, really becoming part of, of jurisdictional awareness and code enforcement which I think is a very intelligent way to, uh, you know, essentially analyze, especially in, in a city such as Ashland, we've got very extreme slope conditions and ensure, um, you know, equal rights for solar envelope. Uh, it's really a, it's an asset and a currency that oftentimes I think we don't, we don't understand or value fully uh, the impact of, of shading our neighbors, if you will, on a number of levels that I, I, I feel like it'd be great if we could, um, if someone would support a motion on those two items and, and recommend that to council unless there's. I, I have a uh, understanding question uh, before we go to a motion. Sure. Uh, are these uh, recommendations or requirements? Oh, these are recommendations. Yep. Stu? Um, just a couple comments. Uh, I think we do have some LIDAR data. Um, I don't have it, but I've I believe it's been done. I don't know that we were invited to participate in the Google project, um, but there is some of that floating around out there. Um, the other thing, I, you know, it's my under, if I'm remembering correctly, and I may not be, uh, that these were proposed in 2015 uh, and Planning Commission uh, chose not to accept them, but I think they accepted one of the other points that was offered. Uh, is that the same thing, Chris? My understanding, it, it did, and I believe it was council that didn't accept oh, okay. those conditions. But yeah, that, that was my understanding. It, planning endorsed these, and I feel like it would be a step in the right direction to renew this. And I think it would, you know, obviously there's still room for improvement, but I think these are two very simple um, recommendations here that would, would hope, give planning the planning department a little bit more um, uh, sway in influencing, I think, design solutions within city limits. Uh, would you would this group like to have a conversation with planning about their thoughts on advancing this before we advance it or do we feel good that because I know Chris you've already talked to them a bit um, yeah. would they be comfortable with us advancing this without discussion yeah and and I don't want to put put words in Bill and Maria's mouth but I it, it was a it, it was um, endorsed and recommended in no short order that that perhaps we revisit these because they they are um, generally in favor. So, yeah. I think uh, I saw Ray and then Gary. Yep, yeah, Ray. Yeah, Chris. Uh, 
Is this in conflict with the second document that you're going to discuss where we're building affordable housing that's three or four stories tall and getting in the shadow of the uh you know and that's that's a good that's a good point Ray I think if you'll notice both of these are are subjective on a lot of levels so okay. I think there's there's qualitative analysis that goes into understanding both of these I, I that that was the other half of my I don't know if you read the the study I actually attached as well about solar access zoning and building information modeling but to me, that's where I see us going in the long term is, is, is really understanding and analyzing the, the real time built environment in order to make jurisdictional decisions rather than metrics and equations that don't necessarily apply to the, as you see it. So you're very correct, Ray, there is a, a clash, if you will, there, but this, I think, leaves it open enough for subjective decision and by the planning department in that regard. Also, do we know why this city council maybe didn't advance these in 2015? I, I can't speak to the reasons um, other than I think perhaps maybe there was, and I, again, I'm, this is a hypothesis here, but I'm, I'm thinking that perhaps there was fear that it gave the planning department a little bit too much input on design orientation, you know, because we are talking about aspects of, of design that, that aren't necessarily purely quantitative okay well solar costs have come down quite a bit since then so maybe uh more open to it mm -hmm. julian i can make a motion if you like uh, if there's no further discussion that'd be great eric or Adam. oh i was really chris just wanting to clarify a, a procedural question the amendments to the development code as I'm sure you know, have to go through the planning commission before they reach the council. And I wonder if what we need to do at this point is to ask the planning department and the planning commission to reinitiate re consideration of these amendments to if they conclude they're warranted to be forwarded to the council. Um, the council really, you know, would only refer it to the planning commission. I think we can ask the planning commission to initiate those actions. Great. I agree. Okay. Then I'll hold off on the motion. So with that, well, I, go ahead, Jerry. So with that, I, Ju, Julian, if you don't mind, I'll substitute for your um, motion. Just that we'll we would we would like to. Um, we propose, or I propose, that we send a memo to the planning department and the planning commission to amend subsection 18.4.8.050-B to include the two items as suggested by Chris. Is there a second? Second. Julian, any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, unanimous. Okay, Chris, uh, I think we're on to your next topic. Great. Um, so housing capacity analysis. Um, I've been representing the Climate Policy Commission at a um, couple sessions of the housing capacity analysis um, studies that have been uh, going on. I, I did attach the uh, presentation from Brandon um, at the Ashland Planning Commission and Housing and Human Services Commission joint study session on January 28th. A very informative document. Um, if you haven't read it, I would recommend doing so. I'm going to just summarize a couple key points here. So uh, there's a projected growth forecast in Ashland of, of just under 2,000 people um, over the next 20 years. Uh, with a demand projection of 858 new dwelling units over the next 20 years as well. Um, there currently is an annual average of, or this would require an annual average of, of um, essentially providing uh, 43 dwelling units per year. I, I believe that is our current annual average of, of built units. And Ashland currently holds um, a 
in their in their analysis or in their study of buildable lands within Ashland Urban Growth Boundary, uh, there's there's currently capacity for 2,764 units, which is somewhat surprising, being that we we continually hear about the housing shortage and subsequently not enough land to build housing on. Um, this this has been somewhat disputed. It's an open panel, so there's a mix of developers on on the panel and um, various other community members. Uh, I think key factors in regards to the the SEEP and the Climate Policy Commission um, are I would, how I see, I, I see are primarily in regards to diversity in our community and and low income families. Uh, the median sales price of a, of a home in Ashland is four hundred and thirty four thousand dollars for $434,438. Um, 53% of Ashland households are non-family households. 75% um, of Ashland households are between one and two people. Um, so obviously not a lot going on there for small families and small families that are, that are trying to grow here. And subsequently, um, between 2000 and 2018, we saw a, a, a primary growth trend of um, age 60 and older uh, population by 3,000 people and projected our, our county, Jackson County retirees will grow between 2020 and 2040 uh, over 18,000. So that's a significant uh, population trend of, a, of an aging population coming to this area, um, which obviously nothing wrong with that. It's just, I think in terms of viability and and uh, resiliency here in our community, we, we obviously need to mix. Um, some solutions here that are that are coming forth uh, from this study and analysis, um, obviously a, a, a broader range and diversity of housing options, how those are perceived and, and made available. Um, uh, more middle housing products, if you will, middle housing products being transitionary housing products that, that do allow for um, generational wealth and eventual ownership of, of homes. Uh, those being, you know, townhomes, duplexes, triplexes, um, and larger multifamily housing opportunities. I think that's, that's a key point here. Um, some regulatory um, recommendations in that regard, uh, administrative and procedural reform, expedited fast track building permits, um, allowing smaller residential lots to build on, um, a mandate or a, a ceiling cap, if you will, on maximum lot sizes, uh, mandating minimum residential densities and increasing allowable residential densities. So those, those both speak really to uh, multifamily housing um, as well as clustered residential development. So. A lot of these are are enforced, um, you know, through code and planning standards. Um, also, reduced street width standards uh, would help in that regard. Um, potential for redesignation or rezoning of land for housing. Those are industrial, employment, commercial areas, possibly allowing for overlays of residential housing in those areas. Uh, encouraging multifamily residential development in commercial zones. Um, and then also providing density bonuses to developers. So the, the document speaks a lot more to those aspects. Um, however, I think we are seeing um, ground being covered in that regard. Uh, if, you've, if you've noticed, I think um, the, the news article on the Super 8 uh, hotel here transitioning into a, a OBRA project for, for shelter and housing transition is a big step forward in this community. And I think it's, it's actually moving, moving us perhaps towards the direction we need to go to, to speak to a lot of these issues. Chris, a question. Um, the uh, tax revenue from new developments, you know, both single family, multifamily, and how that integrates into uh, the planning process in the city's budget. Could you address that? I, you know, obviously it's a big part of the, of the budget income. Um, I, I, I don't want to get too out on a limb there, uh, Jeff, other than saying, I think that there, there definitely is an incentive 
incentivization opportunity. I know that the city is is aware of this. Obviously, they're part of this study, and I think they're really making efforts to um, to move in the right direction on a number of levels. And uh, in terms of budget, I think you are seeing obviously a greater revenue stream from larger projects. You know, it is a it is a permitting fee is is based on evaluation of, of project value, if you will. So um, there is incentivization there to allow for for larger scale work to occur as well. Bob? Yeah, Chris, thanks. Thanks so much for this. Um, I, I went, I watched the, the session, the joint session between the planning and the um, housing uh, commissions uh, a couple of weeks back, and it was very impressive. Um, and I was taken by the fact that the consultants, Echo Northwest themselves, mentioned uh, you know the importance of taking into account the climate and energy action plan so I'm I, I, I'm not I don't know to how they're doing that or what what what's the action uh, that that's being taken or how that's going to be fed in but I'm, I'm kind of curious where this goes from there they're certainly uh, aware of it and I and it was echoed by several of the uh, commissioners the housing commissioners particularly um, but um, so I'm just wondering your thoughts about that. What, what's the time frame going forward, and and where are there opportunities uh, to make sure that we're doing this in a way that you know is is you know furthering the city's climate objectives? Yeah, and I, on, both, I, on both adaptation and mitigation, by the way. Yep, and I I think it as it is. This is a study, right? So it's a it's an open platform for that conversation, and I think it really can encompass everything we've been talking about today on, on a number of levels. Um, you know, everything from fossil fuel use, uh, recommended infrastructure on these projects, how, how um, perhaps there, there are, uh, you know, density bonuses, perhaps there could even be um, climate policy bonuses afforded to some of these, these housing areas as well. Um, so I, I, I think it's been very helpful being a part of this. Um, study and, and uh, did speak to that directly as a representative of the CPC there um, in, in terms of SEEP and, and bringing it into to awareness on this because I think it, it is very important. I think it gives a lot of avenues here too. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> if there isn't anything else, we're uh, running over a little bit here. Uh, Chris, are, are you done? Okay. Yes. Uh, in the few minutes that remain, uh, I don't want to try to uh, march through the uh, topic sheet, um, but I do encourage you all to look at it, and uh, there are already some items scheduled uh, for March. Uh, if there are things that you feel are more important, and there are some things that we're going to have to bring back from tonight, uh, please do let me know. Um, I, I think with that, we're going to, sorry, Gary. I'm sorry, Jeff, I didn't specify in my motion who's going to write that memo. Did you assign that to someone? Um, which or memo? Chris? The memo to the planning commission and the, and the planning department. Yeah, Chris, do you want to write that? For, for the previous topic, the PV reservation, that's the one you're talking about, Gary? No, I Precisely. think Precisely, yes. I would be happy to author that, yes. OK. okay. Um, I think we got a lot done. It was a very packed schedule. Uh, having observed us go through this, I think I'm going to try to have not so many topics at each meeting. because uh, It feels like we're cutting things off a bit prematurely. Um, and with that, I want to uh, thank you all. I uh, particularly want to thank Elizabeth for her uh, meeting minutes uh, from the last time. You did a great job of uh, transforming a lot of uh, complicated topics into something that I think was quite understandable. So I appreciate you doing that. Uh, with that, our, we are adjourned. Thanks, Rick. You've done a, you're doing a great job keeping us 
on track. On track. <laughs> That's not easy. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Hurting yeah. us cats. <laughs> yeah. Bye, my everyone. Mind. <laughs> Good night.